So welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Chiacha. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Curator of Second Street Gallery. We're a 501c3 nonprofit art space located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Just a bit of housekeeping. This is a Zoom webinar, so you can see and hear us, but um, we cannot see or hear you. However, we're recording the talk. Um, so if you do need to step away and, and, um, and leave a little early, we're recording it. We'll put everything online on, and share the links on our website and social media in the days that follow. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So please enter your questions down in the Q&A box. Um, we've also um, enabled the chat. So if you have any other comments that maybe isn't a specific question or anything, you can leave that in the chat box. If there's something that makes sense for us to answer immediately, I'll ask the artists to do that. Otherwise, we'll hold our questions until the end. So for tonight's Artists in Conversation, we're joined by exhibiting artists Deidre Sullivan Beeman and Marina Press Granger of the Artist Advisory for a conversation on Sullivan Beeman's solo exhibition at Second Street Gallery, The Ceremony of Innocence. I'm gonna stop my video here and continue so you can see the two of you. So the Ceremony of Innocence opened at Second Street Gallery's Dove Gallery space on October 7th and will remain on view until 5 p.m. on Friday, November 18th. So you only have two more days to see it in person. The exhibition is made possible in part by a generous grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation of the Visual Arts and the Virginia Commission of the Arts, which receives support from the Virginia General Assembly and the National Endowment for the Arts. And so now a bit about Deidre and Marina before I hand the floor over to them. Deidre Sullivan Beeman is a contemporary surrealist painter born out of the third wave of feminism. She came into her own in Los Angeles in the 1990s alongside cultural movements like Riot Girl, Queer Core, and DIY. As a self-taught artist, Sullivan Beeman utilizes many DIY ethics and methods. Sullivan Beeman lives and works in Los Angeles, California and Vancouver, Canada. While she has a BFA in cinema from the University of Southern California, she is a self-taught artist. I'm gonna try to go to my next slide here. Um, there she is. Her work has been exhibited in notable galleries and museums, such as KP Projects in Los Angeles, Haven Gallery in Northport, New York, Modern Eden Gallery in San Francisco, Burt Green Fine Art in Chicago, and others. You can visit our website for the full list. Sullivan Beeman has participated in art fairs such as Scope Immersive 2020, Aqua Art Miami, Pulse Art Fair in Miami, Florida, and others. Sullivan Beeman has had several solo exhibitions and has been named a finalist in the Imaginative Realism category by the Art Renewal Center three times. You can check out her full bio in our website and we're sharing a link to all of that in the chat. Marina Granger is the founder of the Artist Advisory, a New York City consulting firm that offers career guidance to visual artists, galleries, and art-minded businesses. Granger worked in New York City galleries and museums for nearly 15 years before starting her company. She curated numerous gallery exhibitions and art fair booths during that time. In addition to using analytical business acumen acquired through years of experience and a BA and MA in art history, Granger also uses the principles of classical Chinese feng shui to enhance the success of the artists and businesses she works with. You may read about Marina Granger and the Artist Advisory in Forbes, The Art Gorgeous, The Art Zealous, Time Out New York, and more. Granger was born in Kiev, Ukraine and has lived in New York City since 1991. So thank you both for joining us this evening, and I will hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was such a beautiful introduction, and I'm so excited to be here with Deidre Sullivan Beeman. How are you doing, Dee? Um, <laughs> good. Thanks, Kristen. Um, anyway, hi. How are you? <laughs> I am so good. I, this is such a beautiful exhibition. I was really, really just taken aback when I walked in and I had this sense of discovery when I walked into this room where your exhibition is. 
Uh, for those of you who have not been to Second Street to see the exhibition, Deidre's exhibition is in a gallery that is behind another gallery. Uh, so it really adds to the sense of discovery around her work. It's really amazing. You start to walk through and you walk into this room and you are greeted by these beautiful paintings that are all very, very intimate and small, but then you get close and you see that, or when you start to get in there, you, you see there's this one large painting, which uh, you have here in the photograph. But Deidre, before I go on and on and on, or maybe I'll stop going on and on and on about how cool your exhibition is, uh, I wanted to ask you, would you tell us a little bit about the concept behind this exhibition? What uh, propelled you to create this work? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thanks for having me here. And it was really a pleasure working with Second Street Gallery. Um, it, this was really amazing experience for me and my first time in Virginia. So that was really lovely. Um, the concept, um, you know, I'm basically always trying to um, explore um, the lore of the young woman and empowering femininity. And with this show, which was called The Ceremony of Innocence, I really was exploring the rite of passage. Um, and for me, it's really the moment when a child leaves, a childhood leaves and, and moves on to womanhood. Um, I like to always kind of investigate that moment, um, when, especially for, you know, women being female myself, when the young girl realizes she's a, um, she's not a young girl anymore. So basically it's sort of that switch that gets turned on it's not necessarily a sexual moment it's just the moment when they realize that things are different and that's um that's always what I'm investigating with that that is so uh wonderful yes there is this lore of the young woman uh, and it is very empowering to see this rite of passage uh could you tell us a little bit about uh this painting that we see here, this very large one uh, over here. Um, <clears throat> I just want to ask you because I see that she's following a white rabbit and there's something <laughs> very special, you know, speaking of lore, there's something that we all know, right? When the white rabbit comes to mind and if, you know, all of you that are here, if you want to put in the chat, what comes to mind when you think of the white rabbit? Right. Um, I, I want to see if anyone's going to put it in the chat and tell us uh, before I unlock that. Uh, but OK, well, well, a magical um, journey we've got. Uh, so Kristen Reed says a magical journey. Hi, Kristen Reed. Sophie says time. Steve says running out of time. Katie says Alice in Wonderland. And Richard says, hi, Richard. Grace Slick. Okay. Well, everyone is thinking about Alice in Wonderland. And is tell me a little bit about why you chose Alice in Wonderland for your inspiration here. And if there's any reason that you it matters now more than ever. Um well again, you know, and sociologically, um, you know, this is the stage of transitional adulthood. Um, I think um, Alice in Wonderland, there's a great quote from Alice and says, she says, it's no use going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. And the key thing is um, with the ceremony of innocence, I really just wanted to kind of, um, like I said, investigate this rite of passage. And Alice in Wonderland um, is one of my favorite stories. Um, it's a complicated story because there's so many levels to it. Um, there's a book out about the dark side of Alice in Wonderland. And um, basically, um, 
there's so much symbolism in Alice in Wonderland and with the BFA um, from film school, I just love narratives. And um, I love kind of trying to figure out all the symbolism um, in there. Um, what's also interesting is um, Lewis Carroll, whose real name was Charles Dodgson, was kind of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of character. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, the Alice in Wonderland story is almost more relative, relevant today than even in the past with hashtag me too. Um, in a weird way, um, um, Dodgson, you know, would <clears throat> had this relationship with Alice and nobody knew if Alice was actually real or not. And then um, I believe it was around 1932, um, a woman was trying to sell a manuscript to Sotheby's and it turns out she was Alice Lydell, who was the real Alice. And the manuscript was the handwritten manuscript that um, Lewis Carroll, AKA Charles Dodson was, um, had written and he drew the original illustrations in that manuscript. So then suddenly everybody realized, but more got revealed um, through his own letters after he passed away. And there was a real, um, almost Lolita love story going on there. So um, for me, um, I really like constantly um, looking at women in our culture today. And, you know, this situation, you know, it has been carried on. Um, there's a lot of proof in these letters that he was more of a predator. And as he became better known as Lewis Carroll, um, just like Michael Jackson, parents seem to okay to let their kids spend the night with him. And um, so I bring all this up only to talk about that um, the story of Alice in Wonderland is super, super complicated. Um, the other thing I love about it um, that um, is basically the symbolism. I mean, the um, it's it's very deep and esoterica. And just for example, because I'm heavily into the tarot cards, the Queen of Hearts is really the Queen of Cups, and um, the Queen of Cups is all about um, trying to find your feminine side and trying to connect with your emotions. Um, and so um, I feel like there's all this, it, 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 we could spend a whole hour on this subject, but there's a lot of intrigue about Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland and the symbolism that goes into it. Um, but that's just, a few little tidbits about the book. Yeah. And, you know, it's so interesting. You're right. It's like this transitional adulthood that we're viewing when we're reading Alice in Wonderland, right? Because she literally transforms in that book. Uh, but how she transforms is interesting, right? And what propelled her to essentially follow the white rabbit. So, yeah. uh, and well, there's actually another great quote she gives. She goes, I'm not afraid. I can't explain myself, sir, because I'm not myself, you see. And she says this to the caterpillar as he's got his hookah pike pipe with him. So um, there's these great little um, brilliant um, moments where she's lost. And so she's on that transition. She's um, one of the reasons not, I hope, I'm not jumping, but one of the reasons for the big piece, which is um, Follow the White Rabbit, um, it's kind of a um, mashup of the Beatles, Abbey Road album and Alice in Wonderland. And one of the things that I was kind of trying, if you look at the Abbey Road album, it's kind of interesting because you don't see the other side of the album. You see just them walking across the street and if you actually look at the, because there were plenty of people there that day, and I've seen pictures from other people's camera, there's hundreds and hundreds of people on the other side of the road. So what it is, it's really their passage. And um, I was not a big Beatles fan. They were a little bit 
they were before me, but I love John Lennon. And um, one of the things that I didn't realize until I started to um, investigate this cover was this was their last cover. So it's very interesting. They're actually kind of walking to a new dimension, which is going to be their new lives. They're all going to kind of go their separate ways. And um, so write a passage um, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about rite of passages are super important within the, um, the you know, the whole um, system coming from, um, you know, a lot of times people, like in the Jewish tradition, they, they do mitzvahs when people are 13 years old. And that's very, very important because um, we've sort of lost it in our society, this whole rites of passage. But even though we it's not here, it still happens. So um, having this transition um, is super important in our culture, even though it's actually kind of almost being denied these days. Yeah, wow. Um, <clears throat> there's so many questions I wanna ask you, but since we're on the topic, and I, I also do wanna say what's really interesting to me is that how timely this is. When you give me the example of Abbey Road, for example, I think it's Instagram versus reality. Hang on one second. Sorry, my coughing is also timely. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, tell me a little bit more about the symbols that and your process behind this show. Because um, well, if we could go to the next slide. Um, okay, <laughs> I threw that in just to give you a sense of Alice in Wonderland. Um, so and it um, so here's this is um, Matt Durante. Um, and one of the things um, who's photographing um, for me, so one of the things is when I come up with a concept, um, then I like to work with um, models. And so um, this is my studio in LA. Um, <laughs> you can see we kind of pieced it together so we could do a photo shoot. Um, and one of the things I like to do is, um, so I, I basically come up with a concept. I usually do drawings with my concept. And then I, I kind of try to find the right model who will be um, the person I feel like is going to bring exactly what I'm looking for. Again, having film school training, I, I work that way where, you know, you write a script. And then um, once you've got your script, you find your actors and so forth. So that's my thought process. I handle it very similar to that. The interesting thing is then um, I like directing with the models. And what's also fun is even though I have my very set idea on what I want them to do, sometimes they'll do something different and um, it's completely perfect. So I try to go with what's happening um, at the time there. Um, so that's part of it. And then I don't know if we want to go to the next slide. Um, well, this is <laughs> the big piece. Well, I wanted to ask you before we talk about the slide, it, <laughs> you know, you're so popular in uh, for your technique, right? That you're not the first one to do this, but you're one of few people to do this. You paint in what is called the Miche technique. So you're using a very traditional technique that was it's from the early Renaissance where you mix, well, probably not totally early Renaissance, where you mix um, oil and egg tempera. And when you do that, there's this incredible sheen that's created uh, with the work. And I almost want to say it's so it's so interesting that you came with a, a to towards art with a background from film school because it has this sheen it feels like they're alive right it feels like these paintings are alive so I wanted to ask you to also tell us more deeply about your process and your technique here 
Um, well, I, I really have to credit to Ernst Fuchs, who's now passed away. Um, he died a few years ago in his 90s. Um, um, Fuchs, with about, he's, um, he lived in Vienna. He and um, about four other artists connected together, and they decided they were going to um, try to figure out this 14th century technique of using egg tempera and oil paint. So um, to most artists, the reason that sounds kind of scary is you're not supposed to mix water and oil together. Um, but Fuchs fa figured out a way to make it not fugitive. And it was able to, um, so the way it's done is it's done in layers and everything has to be completely dry before the next layer goes on. Um, I use two type of egg temperas. I use a pure egg tempera, which is basically just egg yolk and water, um, distilled water. And I try to get my eggs, um, the, the best eggs are actually the eggs that you would wanna eat, which is, you know, farm raised, uh, free range chicken eggs. Um, and the water is just distilled water. Um, the second egg tempera I do is a uh, tempera grazie, which is more complicated and, um, has about five different things in it. Um, so I, I, I've been very lucky. You know, I, st I studied with um, Robert Venosa and Fulber Rudolph Jacobson and Lawrence Carrera. I mean, there's so many people that um, I studied this technique and sadly a bunch of them have passed and I feel grateful I was able to um, study with them when I could. Um, so what it is, is um, you start with the egg tempera layer and then um, you do oil and then you do egg and you do oil. And it's sort of like um, a layer cake, but there's 20 to 40 layers um, that goes into this. So with this piece, what you're looking at is I always start at what the back of the painting would look like. So I was, I'm doing a graffiti piece and I know there's brick there. So I actually made the brick. I don't just paint the brick. I, made bricks so we made brick stencils we stenciled it on and um when i say we uh, my lovely cassie um who's my assistant um was helping me um because i had two shows this year um i've i had to produce 18 paintings in one year normally i produce 10 to 14 paintings so, um and the year's not over yet i've got two more paintings to do so it's going to be a total of 20 paintings which is kind of unheard of for me. Um, so the um, so I literally, like I said, if I see bricks in the background, I make I make bricks. Um, we can go to the next slide, and then you can see how it evolves. And then um, I start. This is now the design is getting put on that I, the people are going to stay. I, even the animals are people to me. The um, all the figures are gonna stay out of the, um, what's going on in the background. So they have a very separate thing going on and they are they have a very separate egg tempera um, formula as well. That way they will become more three-dimensional in the piece. Um, we can go to the next slide. So this is, I, I put this in cause I thought this might interest people. So one of the things I do is we, <laughs> I, I paint and paint and paint and then I take the whole thing back out um, with white. Um, so I like having these white layers and I also do the opposite. I don't think I have an example of a dark layer, but I also take paintings all the way up to a dark layer as well. And what I mean about that is I glaze them completely down so they almost go dark again. And um, on um, but this is a reverse. I'm I'm doing a a, a whitewash basically over the entire painting. One of the reasons I do that is I try to unif unify the painting because I do have two different things going on. The background is doing one thing and the figures are doing another. So I wanna kind of bring them as one. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, I, 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 that's just more adding more color in and starting to build it up. Um, that again, I'm starting to now work on, um, the characters and build them up. The contraption that you see, um, was just, um, 
a big thing of plastic. And at night when I was done working, I would keep the painting covered with it. Um, but I would have to put the chairs and stuff to make almost like a tent situation. So, you know, nothing leaned against the painting, got stuck to it while it, it dried. But that way it kept the dust bunnies and everything off the painting. Um, so, okay, we can go to the next slide. So um, this was my first rabbit um, and he really wasn't looking 100% rabbit to me. I, I started to see some like dog looking eyes in. Um, so I ended up changing him, but I put him in because I, I want you to see how, you know, I <laughs> things can get radically changed. Um, and with egg tempera, it, it get, um, with egg tempera and oil, not if you just did egg tempera, if you just did oil, it's not as complicated, but doing both and making changes um, is, is like surgery. It's very complicated. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Well, that's what a rabbit looks like. <laughs> so, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is me making the changes, um, and it you know it gets like I said very complicated to do. Um, so I I redrew the new rabbit face on the body stayed the same, and basically um, I was trying to get rid of what you saw in the background that I couldn't mask in. And then um, I'm trying to build up the the new rabbit face. Okay, we can go to the next one. So that's the face getting built up. Now that all those little hairs are the egg tempera. That's what it looks like. And that's what it can do. Uh, this is why I love it compared to um, oil paint. I, I personally can't get that same um, degree of detail like I can with the, the egg tempera. Um, so for me, that's why I'm a huge fan of it. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And and there's the rabbit um, finished. So it just so now you see the stages that he went through. Um, okay, we can go to the next. So this is me putting on um, the tempera grazi, and um, so it gets. This is just like the first coat, so it looks kind of thin. And um, but as you will see, I, I have another um, couple of slides. It will start to build up. So we can go to the next slide. So this is another painting I'm actually working on um, now, um, and um, that's how thick I really put the temper on. Um, it looks like, you know, almost clown makeup, like I just slathered her in it, but that's basically what I am doing. I'm, I slather uh, <laughs> the, the um, figures in it. We can go to the next slide. And that's the result of it. So that's what it looks like after all the slathering and molding starts to happen. Um, certain spots I go heavier, certain spots I go lighter, and I build it up. So that's not just one attempt at it, that's several attempts. And then the little animal, the ferret, the white ferret on her shoulder is going to get way more built up with, you know, lots of hairs and stuff building up in it. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, that, um, I, I, the piece is getting more finished. You can see the pink paint <laughs> on the ground there. Um, it was kind of tricky working. This is the biggest I've ever worked. I've had some big ones, but um, this was 44 by 66 inches. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. So I put this in because this is one of the things I do to figure out the no tan of a piece. So the no tan is um, in Japan, it was created, um, especially with the ink drawings and there was um, whites and then grays and then the darks. And so the no tan was very clear, like in a Japanese ink drawing, um, where your darks were, where your lights are. Um, I tend to make notes. I, I make the uh, piece black and white so I can see it. And then I always flip it. Um, I use mirrors. I really use everything I can use. Um, but this is one of the ways I check the painting to see if the no tan is working. For So truthfully in this painting, there were two characters that were really important which um, was the, the young woman. And the second one was the rabbit. And then the two, two smaller like um, 
sidekicks was the mouse and the cat. Okay, we can go to the next one. Um, that's just above from my studio. Um, I have a lovely studio with um, um, 30, 30 feet ceilings. Um, so it's kind of fun. You can look down on the painting as well. Um, okay, the next one. And this is the finished product. This is what it looks like. Um, so when I... Um... Oh, Deidre, I, <laughs> I want it. This is so cool. But before we go on, I have just a couple of quick questions for you because I bet everybody's thinking, first of all, how long did this take you? This took minimum three months. Um, I, I think it actually took more than that, but I know there was three months of real painstaking work on this piece. Wow. Wow. I also want to highlight that I've observed you consistently call the, the um, subjects in your work characters, which I think is really interesting. Uh, again, it's a nod to you, you going through film school right? Yeah. And these being narratives and these really being characters. And I'm really eager to uh, show everybody or go through and talk a little bit more about the other paintings as well, because there was an interesting question in the chat about how, in some cases, the uh, character, so to speak, is looking at us, or sometimes mm -hmm. she is looking at the animal, right? right. So uh, really curious to know about that. Uh, but also, since we have this nice big slide of this painting, can you point out some of the symbols aside from the tarot card and maybe tell us a little bit more about the tarot card? It looks like there's a question in the chat about that from Katie. Yes, there is. And I think it's the Hierophant or the High Priestess. It's Which the one? High Priestess. High um, Priestess. Right. So, so I'll go through all this. So the rabbit, so just to talk about rabbits, rabbits are one of the most common um, symbol out there. Um, it's a um, Native Americans use that symbol. The Africans um, have it in their folklore, the Asians, especially the Japanese have it. And so, um, and also the Greek, the Celtics, um, the rabbit has different meanings. It can mean fertility, sexuality. It can also mean new beginnings. There's a lovely story that um, the Japanese have and um, the Cherokee have about the, um, they put the rabbit in the moon for safekeeping. So it also represents the moon. Um, it, they, they represent good luck. You know how some people, which I don't agree with, carry a rabbit's foot, but um, that technically represents good luck. Um, the rabbit can also be a little bit of a trickster. Um, now, um, the other interpretation of the of um, the white rabbit is also um, drugs, as in the Grace Slick song. Um, Grace Slick wrote, based on Alice in Wonderland, I think one of the most brilliant songs um, when she was in her... Um, um, the Her other band, and then she went to... Um, Jefferson Airplane, this was one of the few, uh, there were two songs she was allowed to bring with her and this was one. Um, so so there is a lore that White Rabbit represents like LSD. There's a couple other drugs that it's had that nickname. The, the key thing is, um, you know, he's, he. so actually one thing I need to explain is all my characters, um, I call them daemons and a daemon is not to be confused with a demon. A demon is actually a good spirit and a demon is not a, technically not a good spirit. So daemons um, are, th are there to um, kind of steer my young women onto the, you know, path they, they, that's the right Dharma, which is, you know, path in Buddhism. And um, so the, um, Daemon is can be kind of a protagonist and protective, or the daemon can be an antagonist and um, looks like maybe a trickster and causing trouble. But the bottom line is the goal is for the daemon to help um, these um, young women um, find who they are. Um, so then we also have a mouse and mouse represent um, courage and persistence. Um, and a cat 
actually because of the nine lives and whatnot represents rebirth and resurrection. And they're really like the circle of life. Um, so, and then the tarot card is the high priestess, which represents the unconscious. Um, but it also represents sort of the, uh, there's more subtle aspects of the feminine. There's um, kind of the dark and the mysterious side of the feminine. Um, and um, and then there's the juxtaposition with the mother and loving um, feminine side. So the high priestess is one of my favorite cards. Um, she has her feet in water and water is always the unconscious. So this whole thing is about rebirth. It's about um, courage. And it's also um, like um, Joseph Campbell says, that um, with this procession, um, you, it's a ritual of initiation. And so with ritual of initiation, um, like George Catlin, the painter, he was an adventurer and painter in the 18, uh, early 1800s. He went to a lot of native um, tribes and um, he drew and painted amazing paintings. And some of them were the, how the braves would be, um, go through a ritual to become men. And it was horrible and painstaking and um, almost like a death experience. But that's the whole point. You almost need to die to be reborn. And um, so one of the things is where is she going? Um, is it somewhere good or is it somewhere naughty? Um, is this, she being taken off to a drug den. The point is though, wherever she's going, she's gonna have a major experience that will like the Beatles, take her to the other side of the street. And that will be a good thing. So um, that's, that's what this whole piece means. Oh, wow, Deidre, that is amazing. And I wanna just add about the etymology of the word Damon. You know, Damon stems from ancient Greece, and in ancient Greece, it was considered a protective spirit or a god. And from what I know, the when Christianity started to take over, they uh, turned flipped the meaning of the word, and that's where demon stems from, right? Because they wanted to say, "Hey, these demons are no good. You need to follow Jesus." Uh, and so. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, just a fun fact that I learned recently, but I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your choice to have the graffiti and if there's any symbolism behind the graffiti. Um, the It was really, I like flat space and I was really just trying to play with the background. Um, it's interesting, my earlier work, when I mean earlier, I mean like 12, 15 years ago was much darker, um, more monotoned in color. I really have been kind of playing with color. Um, so um, I'm trying to play with the graffiti side. I don't know if you noticed, but the scribble it says um, WHO, which is who between, um, well, right above the mouse's head between our female hero and um, the rabbit. And it's funny because I, purposely wanted it scribbled and looking very graffiti-like and weird and unreadable. And um, my husband came home and I go, what does that say? And as he goes up to the loft, he goes, who? And I'm like, that was too easy. So I was trying to make this um, more um, abstract. I'm kind of also playing with more abstraction in my work. Um, so um, doing the graffiti is kind of fun. It's more playful for me. Um, um, there, there's some symbolism. Um, the who part is basically like, who are you? Like, who are you? Who is she going to become? What is her story? And um, so there's just kind of play in that. Yeah. Wow. And uh, before we go on, I do want to say how interesting it is that we're looking at who she could become. That seems to be a very strong theme in your work. Uh, from your other exhibition this year at Burt Green, uh, you really took a nod, and I don't think we have that those images in this slideshow, but you took an, um, <clears throat> an investigative look at Anna Mendieta, who uh, fell to her death uh, 
possibly at the hands of her husband, Carl Andre, and who she could have been because she was an up and coming artist. Uh, so I think, you know, I just want to sprinkle that in and say it's so interesting uh, that you are giving us this moment where we look into the present, right? Because this is now, and we just see, well, what's going to happen? Right. This is yeah. up to us to decide. And I think that's a very uh, wise way of interacting with the viewer. So I want to bring us back to this question that uh, Katie had in the chat that was so good. Tell us a little bit about what, when the woman, when the young woman or the young lady is looking at us versus at the animal, is there any symbolism behind that? Um, well, there's it, it's basically so I'm always trying to catch uh, you know an arrested motion which is that you know the one moment where I feel um, again like if I had a um, film in the old fashioned film where you had a roll of film and there would be just one slide one image I'm trying to um, capture that with that with her looking out at us she's basically asking us is she making the right decision to follow this rabbit the rabbit is really you know um in this procession the leader and he's taking her somewhere we don't know where um so she's kind of asking for our approval and um so that's why i have her looking at us like is this an okay idea um mm -hmm. The um, there's another piece I have um, face to face to face. I don't think I have that in here. Oh wait, well, we do. We, we have the images from the show. Yeah, this piece. Yeah. Um, yes, I had her looking at the bowl. Now that was very important. So I spent most of my summers as a kid in San Miguel de Allende. Um, and, um, one of the things when I met my husband, we both had in common was, um, he spent his childhood in Mexico at city. And I remember one of the questions I said, well, how many bullfights did you go to? Cause I had to go to them all the time. It was the big thing in San Miguel de Allende, um, were these bullfights. And then, um, at the end of the bullfight, they served chili con carne, which is supposed to be the bull. And I was horrified. I, 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 I hardly eat any meat. <laughs> that might be one of the reasons why. But I, the, the, the brutality of it, the horror of it, was really too much. And you know, I was very young. Um, I, I started going to San Miguel. I think at six years old. And I think my last time I went there was around twelve or thirteen. Um, so the problem is um, for me. Um, I felt that. Um, the bull was misunderstood and I always wanted to go save it and jump in the ring and save it. So this is a um, piece where she's actually, there's two, there's different levels to the symbolism on this. Um, and um, one of the is, you know, the, the bull is it, it, in symbolism, the bull um, is a protector. That's one of his qualities and um, chastity and patience. Um, she is also looking face to face with him because she is finding the bull strength within her. Um, and she is connecting with her daemon, the bull, um, on a love level. That's one of the reasons I put this heart. Now the heart is a graffiti heart in the background, but one of the reasons, um, and there's a little heart underneath the bull, um, his um, neck, I put a second heart. I'm trying to emphasize that the love they have for each other. And like in Ferdinand, the bull, you can't judge a book by its cover. So um, that was the, um, and, and, and face to face symbolically um, in um, tribal was considered actually out of love and respect. Love that. That's so cute. That's a true daemon, a protector, right? And, exactly. you know, uh, does this at all uh, have anything to do, is this at all, um, were you thinking about the charging bull at Wall Street and this 
you know, it's, I, I'm going to be honest with you and it's kind of embarrassing. I totally forgot, you know, living in LA and um, maybe only getting to New York, maybe once a year um, mm -hmm. with COVID, I hadn't gone in years. I literally forgot about that bowl. Um, and I forgot that then the, I, one of the statues, I think it was the girl was moved um, close yeah. to her. So it was kind of weird when I was putting this together and a friend of mine goes, oh my gosh, that reminds me <laughs> of, you know, the New York Bowl. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that was in my subconscious. You, I never know where I get things. Um, I do keep a dream journal. And so a lot of the paintings I paint are actually my dreams. And I kind of just give you a little snippet of a part of my dream. So, but I know for a fact that um, this connection with the bull, with bowls um, is definitely connected for me. It's a very personal experience, um, kind of the trauma and the horror of a, a small child in San Miguel de Allende, which in a weird way, there was a rite of passage there. Um, I didn't speak the language um, and um, I, you know, was always wondering why I'm spending my summers and I wanted to be in my grandmother's pool instead. Um, but in a, in a in a sense, I was too young to realize it was one of the greatest gifts that was given to me. Um, my color palette is 100% the colors of San Miguel. Um, I, I paint actually not, I'm kind of known for doing contemporary pop surrealistic work. The truth is what I paint is magical realism. And um, I was so lucky to, um, my mom's an artist. So um, we would spend all our summers hanging out with, you know, tons of artists and being in a very artist enclave. And so um, looking back, it was probably um, the best gift that was given to me, even though I didn't understand it at the time. Wow. And Deidre, I have one final question for you. And if we could just go back in the slideshow to an installation view, uh, because or maybe the one just before this, where we have the large, yes. So you recently started to increase the scale of your work, right? Uh, for a long time, you really stuck to very intimate work, which I think was very interesting, given that the technique is from the Renaissance and paintings from the Renaissance were, uh, if they were private devotional um, pieces that we now know of, they were usually small, right? Um, and that has to do with the painters being trained as manuscript illuminators. So what propelled you to start to paint large? Because this is the largest painting you've done to date. And does that do anything to the concept behind your work? Does it add to the uh, interpretation that we can have of the painting? Um, well, to me, what I love about going big is it kind of magnifies what I'm saying. Um, now, everybody has to realize, you know, I've been um, growing up with a mother. I've been painting since the earliest I remember is five. Um, we had um, um, a um, artist from Key West stay with us. Um, I'm just blanking on her name right now. It'll come to me. Um, that um, was a figurative painter. And so I've been, um, you know, around this, but even though I was around it, the last thing I wanted to do was um, be in the art world like my mother. I was actually trying to avoid. So I think for me um, starting out, I had to start small because there was a side of me that um, just, it, it, it was real personal to me. And I was really painting facets of myself. So e even though um, I use other models and stuff, really they're um, they're little little bits of my story. So um, for me, um, I think starting small and um, you know kind of dipping my toe into this and seeing you know is anyone even going to like this? I wasn't sure. I think it's one that you know I had. A, I remember my cousin saying to me you know, how long are you going to keep this a secret from people <laughs> that you can actually, you know, paint? Um, but I, um, I was very terrified, to be honest with you. And it took me, um, you know, even though in high school, I, I paint, I painted and um, did very well and won a bunch of national awards. 
um, and got a full scholarship to Pratt, which I turned down to go to USC. I think for me, the main reason is I just didn't believe in me. So I think that this whole rite of passage um, is also my story. Um, I needed to take a while and I needed to start small. Um, I will tell you, Sean Cheatham um, and um, was trying to encourage me to go bigger. And um, eventually when I did go big, bigger, he's like, you know, how did you like it? And I'm like, I really like it. I like going bigger. So, you know, I keep going bigger and bigger. Um, I'm working on a couple big pieces right behind me. I don't know if you can see them. Um, so this is a way I work. I do a drawing. Um, sometimes I do a drawing on a paper and then I transfer it or I just draw it with charcoal right on the canvas. Um, and, um, you know, this is, um, so I am starting to go bigger. I have a little teeny piece right here. Um, it's kind of in the dark and it's been glazed back. So it's hard to see her. Um, but um, um, I'm still doing small too, because I really, um, there's something beautiful um, and delicate about the small pieces. And there's something, um, you know, fun and entertaining um, about the large pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, these are given the hmm, your rate of passage, finally going big, right? Taking the leap and going big. I think this is such an interesting perspective with which we can look at the work because essentially these paintings become tokens to us of a rite of passage. So it, the overall message is you too can do anything. Absolutely. I truly believe that. I think, um, you know, the world's your oyster. Um, just, you know, do what you want to do. Just make sure you're happy doing it. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Um, so I don't know if you guys, I, if you're interested, um, but I, we could look at the different pieces in the show. Um, I Maybe. saw Tell us, maybe we can go through the slides and you can. Yeah, and I can give you about. what symbolism yeah. is and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of have fun. Yeah. So, this piece, um, again, I did, decided to do the graffiti background on this. Um, so, goldfish um, actually mean um, wealth and prosperity. Um, in Asian cultures, you know, they've got koi, they've got goldfish um, um, in their ponds, and it brings in really good feng shui. It's a, it's a it's a positive money um, bringer. The umbrella um, is kind of a canopy of the heavens and she's kind of under shelter. She's being protected, but it also represents also the, you know, cause it's round like the sun. So, um, um, so that's what is in this piece here. And by the way, this is um, a muse of mine, Annika Decker. She's an amazing, um, model and you know I, I you guys will see her she's been in lots of my pieces and she's adorable so you want we can go to the next piece I guess um somehow this one looks like it's getting cut off but um this is um the manifest and um this piece um if you can see it it's kind of being cut but the, the hummingbird is um the daemon there and um you know, hummingbirds are um, a sign of hope and good luck. Um, they 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 can also mean that like a, a like a loved one um, is close by. So, and then I have a little pentacle that she's holding with feathers coming out of it. And pentacles, again in in tarot, um, tarot they um, mean money. money. So it's like she's got a little bit of money with her. And then feathers are protection and love. So, um, so that's what this, the symbolism of those. Wow. And this we talked about. Um, so <laughs> this piece, um, when we fly, um, so that's an ibis. And again, it's being cut off. Um, but the, I, I think it is, or at least on my screen, it is maybe, oh, sorry. I think it's me. Um, any, any, sorry about that. Um, so the ibis um, is, I, I just love it because it's an Egyptian um, cool bird. Um, but the ibis is all about balance and purity. And so it's balancing also on a plane. And the plane 
represents the age of Aquarius. Um, we're in the age of Aquarius, which is air. And that's why suddenly we have crypto. We um, are on this Zoom together by air. And uh, we've got Google. So that's what this is all about. Yeah, and we're also entering, uh, <laughs> let's do a deep cut. We're entering period nine in feng shui, which is all about uh, new technology. Wow. Um, Love that. And so, yeah, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> or, <laughs> we're getting there. So. Um, so the B is um, very industrial. Um, it, 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 you know, the bees work together as a, a team, but it's also um, bees are, um, because they're very industrial, also re represents fertility. Um, but the bee also in um, Catholic religion represents the Virgin Mary. So um, there's, and I was raised Catholic. I'm not a practicing Catholic, um, but I, I, I love all the symbolism of it. So the bee is um, connected with the Virgin Mary. The uh, mask is, you know, transports one into um, realms of the unseen. So, so she's got this um, protector um, with her, and she's kind of in the unseen realms. And that's also called the flowers we find. And then this is follow the white rabbit, and this is plaque till time. Um, and this is a, a beautiful. Um, model Amaya um who's so lovely and um this is a bluebird sitting on her and bluebirds represent joy and hope and the clock is you know the keeper of time um so she's it's like she's time's on a short leash there and I don't know what is there another one I can't remember that's it. That's it. Kurt, uh, this is so wonderful, Deidre. I really, you know, I thought I knew about your work before this, but now I feel like I know so much more. So thank you so much for that wonderful uh, talk. And I just want to see if we have any questions in the chat. Let's see. Um, uh, we do have a question from Richard. <laughs> Hi, Richard. He's asking if the rabbit wearing a John Lennon suit, uh, is it is it the John Lennon suit from Abbey Road? Well, if um, if if we remember, um, Lennon was actually wearing a white linen suit. Um, and I will tell you, I come through so many pictures because the Abbey Road album is really hard to really see clearly what's going on there. And it's great. It was so photographed that... Um, whole event of shooting the cover so there was so much footage um for me to look at and um so it is a white linen suit i decided to turn into a cream colored suit um i feel like he's a little bit of a dirty character so he's not pure <laughs> so he's not in pure white um so um so anyway yeah i actually i don't know why i want to read this quote to um from the matrix it says neo was told by trinity to follow the white rabbit and when neo did that he discovered the truth behind his reality wow so. oh that's so good uh question from katie she said she's asking is there a significance in the young woman taking paul's spot i'm, I'm guessing paul mccartney well, there wasn't really a significance per se, um, but the significance of why I put her in that spot was if you look at the Abbey Road um, album, and it's so funny because I, I looked through so many images and I even got the images of the outtakes that the photographer didn't use, um, those images. And they were really having a hard time getting this together and walking you know, in unity or walking in a straight line. Um, and in every take, Paul's messing it up. So in this um, image, Paul's actually out of step, even though he looks like um, everybody's got one leg forward and they look like they're all unified. Paul's actually got, I, now I'm getting, I think he's got his right foot forward and the rest have their left foot forward. 
Um, so what was um, great when um, Rebecca, who's this beautiful model from New York, um, and I don't know if she's on, but um, the, um, we, you know, I, to direct it, I had Becca move her, um, you know, to be out of step purposely, like how Paul was. So, um, so one of the reasons symbolically I wanted her out of step is she's in this processional, but she's also not, that's why she's also looking at us. She's also not a hundred percent, um, you know, sure about this. So, yeah. Yeah. well, it, and, it, and uh, that's kind of interesting because, uh, we have a comment from Karen LaFontaine, who's also an artist, who says, personally, I would tell the girl not to follow the white rabbit. He will steal her innocence. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's interesting, you know, like the um, Orobus, um, which is the, um, it's like a serpent or a dragon that eats its own tail. And that's all the circle of life, right? You know, that's uh, birth, life, death, and then rebirth. We, we have to have um, this rite of passage happen. And there has to be in a weird way, a kind of um, death experience. It doesn't have to be a physical death, but there's a side of the old her that she's leaving behind and the new her that she's gaining. So um, in one sense, she has to go through this ritual of initiation. Wow, wow. Very cool. Another observation about her is that she's also not wearing shoes like Paul. Yes. <laughs> Richard, <laughs> Richard, yes. Uh, we have a question from Jess. And uh, if there's another question, we'll take that. But otherwise, we're going to close up to questions. So from Jess, she's asking, can Deidre talk about her decision to make many of the young women a ghostly white? Mm. Um, so um in Plaque Hill time, you'll see, you know, she's 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 not white, but part of it is my process. Um, so I um when I use the egg tempera, that's the white. I only use titanium um to make the egg tempera. And so, like for example, that flower, the image now of that the, that's all um it it can get this three-dimensional look, which sadly, when it's put on screen, we tend to lose. Um, because the tempera gives almost like a molding feeling to the painting. And um, that's one of the things I love. So this ghostly white um, feeling is exactly because the tempera is, is, is so pigment loaded. And that's another reason my work gets hard to photograph because um, the high pigment load of the egg tempera acts as a mirror and causes a reflection in the um, into um, the camera. So um, so the, the white has kind of this, this ghostly white look is process. And then I also started to enjoy it. Um, and then I kind of kept going with it. So, but I can glaze uh, my young women down and then, you know, they, they get more color in their skin. Very cool, very cool. Well, thank you so much, Deidre. I am so grateful that I was able to do this talk with you. And as Kristen said, there are two more days to see your exhibition. So if you are in Charlottesville, get over there. They're open uh, <laughs> and see this show for yourself because it is truly stunning. And like Deidre said, it is hard to photograph. And even though the photographs are amazing, it does take it to the next level when you see them in person. So thank you so much, Deidre. And I'm going to hand it over to Kristen. Yes, thank you both. And there are, like Marina mentioned, there are two days left to see both um, this exhibition and our Megan Marlatt exhibition in the main gallery that you can kind of get a peek of here in the photo. So we have two days left. We are open Thursday and Friday from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m. Um, if you're not in Charlottesville, you could visit our website and read more about the show, see images and installation shots, and then browse available works from the exhibition. Um, now, just a couple of Second Street Gallery announcements. We have um, 
Giving Tuesday is coming up. So as many of you know, Second Street Gallery is a nonprofit art space and we rely on the generosity of the community to put on exhibitions like these and do programs like today's Artist Talk. So you can visit our website for ways you can support the gallery. If you'd like to make a contribution today, we're sharing a link in the chat box. Um, next up is on December 17th is our next free in-person family studio day. We'll be hosting a printmaking activity in the gallery, so you can check out our website for more info. We also currently have an open call for submissions, so if you're interested in um, showing your work at Second Street Gallery, have a look at our website and check it out. This is actually how Deidre's exhibition was chosen. She was a call for submissions pick for this current season at Second Street. And finally, we have two exhibitions opening on December 2nd on First Friday. So check out our website, follow us on social media, or sign up for our email list for more information in the coming days. And so thank you both. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And I hope to see everyone in the gallery again soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.